Um, uh, my name's Abe Newton. Uh, I'm a BI consultant uh, here in Oklahoma City area. I've been working with uh, SQL Server and various, uh, and doing data stuff for, I don't know, 18 years at least. Uh, I think I first ran into SQL Server back in 99 when I was sl slinging pizzas at Papa John's Pizza. Back when I was in college, I, one of my coworkers brought out he had a laptop up there with SQL Server on, and I didn't know what it was, but uh, little did I know I'd be spending a lot of time with that later on in life. Um, recently, I've probably been uh, hanging out with the Power BI user group. Uh, I've been to the SQL Server user group uh, in the past, been a long time. Uh, I saw some of the cool things you guys were doing and uh, uh, building labs and things like that, and I thought it was pretty cool, and uh, I thought I had a presentation here that kind of Across both areas, I thought it'd be cool to uh, talk to you all about building the billion row dashboard, uh, is what we call it, working with direct query versus import. Uh, if you don't understand what those are, we'll get into it and we'll hopefully try to answer some of those questions and have a little fun doing so. Um, let's go, I gotta find my page down button here real quick, new keyboard that I don't use very often. Here we go. There we go, maybe I can just click on it too. So uh, some of the questions we're gonna explore again, uh, what is the best way to create a billion row dashboard? What is import? What is direct query? Uh, what is dual storage mode? Why would we choose one over the other? Can we use them at the same time? And again, no particular order to these. Uh, Let's see. Ah, oh, we can just click. Ah, I thought this was kind of cool, especially for my daughter who's in attendance, just to kind of give them a, a little explanation. What does a billion records look like? I've seen this a million times over the years since the spawn of the internet. Keep in mind, these are uh, $1, oh, $100 bills, so we got to kind of look at what a, a billion records would look like or a billion dollar bills. We would take, the, we could look at the, uh, I don't know if you can see my pointer there. Uh, Oh gosh, I never turn on my control little thing that usually shows uh, where I'm at for once in my life, I need it. Uh, so if you took the uh, $1 billion uh, deal there, if we're, since we're looking at $100 bills, we could multiply this by 100. So there's 10 pallets of uh, $100 bills. So if we, we could go with uh, basically that times 100, which would be 1,000 pallets to equal uh, $1 bills. So we'd have 1,000 of those pallets to create $1 billion in $1 bills just to kind of give you explanation of what a billion records would look like, a billion of anything. When you really, really think about it, you're like, oh, okay, I've got a big big database, big table. I've got, I hear sometimes some people like, oh, I've got 10,000 rows in this table, or I've got a million. Oh, I've got 100 million. Okay, we're gonna look at a billion. Um, some people dealing with a trillion. Some people dealing with 100 trillion. How do we get to that stuff? So I feel, I've, I've for a long time wanted to, uh, been working with database, and I found that it, I really needed to build labs. I always thought it was really cool that they're, uh, did a thing working with SQL Server Labs, building your own SQL Server Lab. They had a video that the group put up last month. Go check it out. It's a good thing to get you started on building a lab. Uh, I highly recommend that video. Uh, I've been building them for about 10 years. I kind of found out, I was like, hey, I just want to build something really big, uh, put a lot of records in a table, start playing with it. I found, and as I've become a consultant, uh, freelance consultant, I've kind of found that, hey, I need some demonstration stuff to show clients. Uh, show them how things work, show them what they do, and you can't really, it's hard to put those up at the last second. You really gotta have something uh, with some dummy data in it, some demo data already pre-configured that you kinda know what you're working with, uh, that you can kinda show off some of the new features. Uh, so that's what I've been working to, towards for a long time. I have a lab that I built in my house, kinda have one here, but I'm gonna hook in, we're gonna be uh, connected in my home lab as well, so kinda give us a little bit more horsepower and some stuff that I have pre-configured for that kind of stuff. Uh, let's see, moving on. Uh, well, that first question in there, what is the best way to create a billion row dashboard? Uh, when I say dashboard, I kind of think of visualization dashboard. Uh, we're not specifically talking about a table with a billion, you might be hitting a, a, a table with a billion rows. How do you, how do you show that to your uh, people that are gonna be viewing your report, the executives, the managers, the people who are gonna make business sense of that data? 
uh, you need to visualize it in a way. Uh, a lot of the visualization tools that you're using today that you'll come across if you're a data person, uh, any kind of person doing BI. Uh, Power BI is a big one. Uh, I work with that heavily. I work with Spotfire heavily. Uh, Tableau is another big one. Those are probably the three big ones. I know there's some others like uh, I think called ClickView and things like that are pretty big as well. But these visualization tools, they're kind of the last piece. You've got your data in your uh, database, SQL Server, could be Hadoop, could be Oracle, what, like a relational database, or it could be a NoSQL database, but you usually want to put it, pull it out of there and put it in a system that's uh, good for visualization. That's what your Power BI's and things like that do. Or Excel, Excel's another uh, tool that you could use as well. Pull it into Excel, create co cool charts and visualizations to make sense of the data. So if you've ever tried to work with uh, any of those tools, after a certain point, as the data gets larger, it gets tough. Uh, I think it was just 10 years ago that you could put more than, uh, more than about 64,000 records in Excel directly. Uh, uh, before 2007 Excel, there was a hard cutoff. 64,000 rows, boom, that's it. That's as much data as you're pulling into Excel. So you had to pull that data from an external source. And we didn't have all these. There was a uh, Tableau and some of those were starting to make a name for themselves. We didn't have Power BI, Spotfire. I hadn't heard of yet, but I think it was starting to maybe come around. So you needed that tool to visualize that data. Those t uh, so those tools use a little bit different technology uh, for storing data, importing it, and uh, letting you see more records. They've got an Excel, you can get some more records in there. You can get up to, you know, they kind of give a hard, rough estimate of a million records, but that's kind of a, how you have everything modeled, and it's not near as quick as using something like Power BI or Spotfire or Tableau. Uh, so when you get into a billion rows, that gives uh, problems to even some of those tools, uh, the Spotfire, the Tableau, uh, the uh, uh, Power BI. Those, those tools, you can pull records in, like Power BI has a hard stop. You can build basically a, a database model in that. Uh, it's like an in-memory row store database. You can pull that in, but it's got a hard, pretty much a hard stop at about a, a million rows. Uh, so, you're kind of dead in the water there unless you've pre-aggregated your data out of your source system before you got in there. So uh, one of the things we're gonna look at today, as we kind of mentioned in the uh, subtitle of the, of the talk, is uh, import versus direct query. Import's when we're pulling the data directly into our uh, in-visualization tool like Power BI and putting it into the model there, uh, the relational model there. Uh, but with the hard stop, we need some other tools, some other uh, features such as direct query, which is something that Power BI offers and some of the other tools that have their own versions of Spotfire has, I don't know what they call theirs, I've used it in the past, but they have a kind of a direct query format as well. The direct query basically is called, it's kind of like a folding technology. It takes the query that you write in Power BI and pushes it, basically offloads that query down to the source system uh, and converts it into the native language of SQL Server, which is T-SQL, or Oracle uses the PL-SQL, or whatever language you might be using. It'll go out and uh, you can uh, do things off Data Lake using the query languages they, they hit off theirs. They have, a, uh, they, have a, they have about four or five different languages that they support for direct query. There's a lot more for import, but uh, you, you're a little bit more limited there. But what that does, it allows you to harness that, uh, the end system there, and hit some bigger, larger tables. Uh, that are more the, have the upper bounds of the source system, say SQL Server. SQL Server, if you set it up right, you can get into possibly trillions of rows. But, so it's basically gonna offload it there and then bring the aggregated data back to your, uh, to your dashboard so that you can display it there. Okay, yeah, the next thing I wanna do, I wanna do a little short demo here, uh, kinda show uh, uh, Power BI, uh, like an executive dashboard kind of example using some dummy data. Uh, most of the, so the examples I use here, I'm out using the free uh, Microsoft provided uh, wide world importers database. Uh, it's a good one to start with. Uh, it's got a lot of their features set up in there, kind of on a relational model with a bunch of data in there. So I've taken those and I've poured some extra data into some of the tables uh, to get it into. I've got a row in there, like in the sales table, the fact sale table, it's a uh, star schema based uh, dimensional model. So in the fact table the lar that records all the sales, I've did some work to kind of load in a billion records, kind of dummy it up a little bit and uh, get that thing loaded up. And I've created a dashboard in Power BI on the web service piece. We're gonna look at the web service 
Power BI piece, and we'll do some stuff with the local Power BI file in memory on my, on my desktop as well. So let me fire up the, let me log into my Power BI real quick. If you're unfamiliar with this, this is the Power BI portal. A lot of people use Power BI, they don't see this piece. Some people use mainly on their, des their desktop uh, tool, they have a desktop, uh, Based desktop database tool called Power BI. Uh, this is their, you can upload it to the web as well. This is the web interface um, for sharing within, throughout your organization. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do here. Uh, what we're looking at here is a dashboard that we've created uh, off of a series of reports. Let me see if I can maybe scroll it down a little bit more size for the, yeah, there we go. Perfect. Uh, this is kind of an example of something you might show an executive, uh, we have a series of dashboards based off a fact sales table. We're looking at profit across the nation, uh, broken down by state that has, uh, from a fact table that has a billion rows in it. So if we look, I'm gonna go in, uh, click this, we're gonna open in focus mode, kind of zoom in on this, and we can kind of see highlight over these, we get, sorry, it's not formatted for the right uh, financial, but what we have in there is, if I remember correctly, not seeing my commas in there, I think that's 176 billion, or it might be $17.6 billion in profits, so whatever, uh, that, that state, uh, wow, they're, they're like the richest company in the world there, apparently, so they had a wonderful year. Uh, so that, that's kind of cool. So we can kind of see, this is actually a built off live, direct, this is direct query data, live. So the dashboard's a little bit, it's a little bit weird, kind of hard to explain how the dashboards work. They're pulling off uh, a scheduled refresh of direct query that actually pushes the queries down to SQL Server that I have running on my lab at my house. So this is up in the cloud at uh, Microsoft, pushes it down through a data gateway. We'll kind of look at that here in a second. But the way they, these dashboards are, they, they, I think they're a pretty cool way to do. So we're talking about how we do a billion row dashboard. If I'm showing this to an executive, they probably don't wanna see this thing refreshing every, you know, taking 10 minutes to refresh a billion rows. So something like this is on a scheduled system. So it, it pulls it maybe once a day, depending on how much you can, if you pay enough money, you can have it reschedule, refresh like every 15 minutes or so and kind of have uh, ready to go tiles. Or you can click on them. We can actually go down and, uh, click on some of the data underneath and see in real time what it's doing. Uh, so if I click, let's see, I'll get to those here in just a second. But this kind of, we have a further breakdown in this dashboard, I've kind of got some individual sales so we can kind of look in, zone in on specific states, kind of see what the cities are doing with the, within the states as well. Uh, if we kind of, let's look at the focus mode again. So now we're looking at just New York and now we're at a uh, city level I believe instead of a state level, we can kind of see breakdown of what that profit was like across that city. So that's something I would say is great for an executive. Uh, you can see a yearly breakdown of what the profit is by year. So, and you kind of see over here, oh wow, 2000, <laughs> 2010, 2011, we had some mega sales. It really dropped off. <laughs> we hit the floor. So basically something, you know, what happened in 2013, I don't know, this company bottomed out. Of course, that's where I kind of, the dummy data I put in was all for like a two, two year span, kind of a random two year span within there. Uh, kind of ran out of time putting more data in there. Someday we'll, we'll complete this out and try to uh, fill that out with more random data. But, so an executive might want to see this, but if we got a, a data analyst, somebody's kind of working more with the data trying to explore, he might say, hey, let's go figure out what's wrong with that, uh, what happened that year, let's go explore it a little bit more. Uh, what we can do here, I may get there the wrong way, but I'm gonna click on my workspace. That dashboard was looking, it's the one with the star here, uh, the WWM Porters underscore one. Uh, I can click over here in the service, it's kind of cool, with it. I, like, I like having it in the service, it, it's got some cool features, it makes it more accessible to everybody. Sometimes it's cool to kind of import it on your desktop if you can, but make it available to the enterprise if you've got a lot of people that wanna see this, and I can quickly, they can hand it off to me, they, they, I, can, I can be pretty brand new to this report and I can click this button here that says view related. Say what's making up this uh, dashboard here. 
Well, we have a report and a data set. So a report is usually what you see in Power BI or Spotify or something like that. And then the data set is the actual model and the data behind it. So I can look at that. Okay, we have a report. Now let me go explore that report a little bit. And yeah, I will try. If nothing else, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of focus in on one of those. How's that looking? Some of it's going to be good. Some of it's probably going to be bad. And so here we're actually seeing the live dashboard tiles from this report. So these are the re uh, we have a couple of panes here. This is a Power BI report uh, that's hitting the actual database in real time. So it's refreshing right now. You kind of see little spinny things over in the right and left as that report, uh, report refreshes. And then you can pick, so we can have multiple reports put up there and they go into a dashboard. So I think the dashboard, I, I can't remember if I've made it from a couple different reports or not, but you can kind of create an executive summary there. Let me let that one refresh. So it's coming in, um, it's gonna take just a minute. I probably wouldn't wanna hand this off to an executive and have them wait on it at a board meeting. So this is something I would kind of explore on my own, but you get some more power with this kind of interface right here to explore a little bit, uh, get a few more answers. Uh, so for instance, we can look at, then we have our drill downs and things like that. We can, actually let me drill it up. There we go, so now we've got our 2011. So I could click on, let me see all the profit for 2011, and that's gonna send all these now are spinning, even if you can't completely see them. When they update, it's gonna update all the other visualizations to 2011. It's actually sending a, creating a Power BI query, and those all just updated, so now we've seen 2011. We could drill down into these and do a lot of fun stuff like that if we wanted to. Uh, it's actually sending over the wire to the SQL Server database, transporting, uh, taking that, what's called DAX language that Power, uh, Power BI uses, converting that to T-SQL, querying the billion row tables and its the relational database there, pulling it back in, converting it to DAX language and updating these visuals at powerbi.com. And then you, and again, we can see, we've got that and then we've got our data sets as well that we can see and we can schedule our refreshes and that's gonna be kind of harder, I know, for y'all to see there. But we can, we can schedule our refresh and we can pull, we can actually explore the data and just kind of play with the data and add things to the data there as well. So, kind of creating, so as I was creating this lab and this uh, project, it kind of came from something from the Power BI user group, a feature came out, uh, it was called dual query mode, uh, which is a combination that came out in the last six months to a year that Power BI now offers, which is, uh, allows you to run Power BI uh, data model. You can create a visual uh, dashboard that uses import as well as direct query. Import being you pull the data into your table, direct query being it goes out to the source system and runs a query in the source system language. Previous to about six to nine months ago, you could only run one or the other. The whole model had to be in one or the other. Uh, if it was import, gave you the most flexibility of working with the most data sources, uh, types of data sources and multiple data sources. Direct query was highly limited in that there was only a few types of data sources and everything had to come from that single data source. You couldn't mash up data sources, which is one of the cool things about Power BI and Spotfire is that you can mash up data sources and bring multiple SQL systems together. Because a, a lot of your big organizations aren't all using SQL Server or one system. It's not all on one server. You've got multiple servers, probably multiple SQL servers. You might have Oracle, you might have Hadoop, you might have multiple things. You need to pull those together. And there might be ad hoc files, ad hoc data coming in that you want to be able to mash up. So the dual mode allows us to, uh, a lot more flexibility in doing that in Power BI to mash up multiple sources or just pull, maybe, hey, you got a quick file in you want to put against your current model. Maybe it's running direct query. Now you can pull, import that data file and put it in there. So as I was building that, I, was, I got tasked with kind of, uh, for the Power BI user group, uh, talking about this feature. So as I started exploring it and looking at direct query, it was going to be heavy on direct query. 
what do we need to build that? So it's kind of like, okay, we need, we need an example. We need a large table, something that you wouldn't normally put into uh, a normal Power BI database. So let's start building a, a big table. And that's something I kind of wanted to do for a long time, building labs and trying to uh, build larger tables. So you got to kind of explore, like, uh, when you need some dummy data for one, something that is not private PII data or company data. So I, I started with the Wide World Importers database, and then I started... Okay, it's like, I need to build this up. Let's put a bunch of it. I started with a, a simplistic approach of putting a lot of data in there, but then I wanted a little bit more realistic and uh, random data. So I started coming up with some more techniques, re research some more techniques, but you can quickly do it the wrong way, make it slow, or it can eat up too much hard drive space. So um, I think I put a, to get to a billion records, started calculating it was going to be around anywhere from 100 to 350 gigs of storage space to do a typical T SQL row-based table. So you start thinking, I need hard drives, or, or you think, should I do this in Azure? Make it more flex, put it out there. Got to start calculating. Am I going to have that Azure thing up? How much compute do I need? What's that going to cost me a month? Uh, is it better just go buy some new hard drives for my current system, things like that? That you start, you start getting and start calculating those things as you start moving into that kind of space. As you would if you were storing that at a company as well. I've been at uh, I've been involved in projects where they do that. Let's bring in a billion. You probably need to start uh, figuring out storage because storage, uh, although a lot of people say it's free, it's not free. There's cost to it, and there's cost to computing on large amounts of storage is where a lot of your cost is going to come. So, uh, I want to give a little. We're going to go over some different. We're going to hit on some different aspects, make it a little bit for everybody. We're going to kind of talk through some things that are maybe make sense to you, some of the room, and don't make sense to some of the room. I thought this one would be great because. Some of it made sense at the Power BI, and then some of the stuff was more SQL Server heavy ones at the Power BI user groups, kind of, everybody had glazed looks, but I thought it was good to kind of get them exposure and vice versa. Uh, how does Power BI store data? Uh, as we kind of talked, I mentioned there's import, there's direct query and dual, and we've kind of gone over some of those, so uh, just kind of touch base a little bit further. Power BI uses the column store table storage format, uh, similar to SQL Server's column store format, which is one of the newer features of SQL Server in the last few years. Uh, the ta tables are typically cached into memory uh, for quicker query response. Direct query, uh, which is the Power BI, we've talked about that, it's going to send it down to the source system database, basically fold those queries out. Dual is just a combination of both, and when you're querying a dual table, it's going to, one of the cool things is the Power BI engine figures out on its own should it be uh, running a T-SQL query or a Power BI query. So it kind of looks, it's got some measurements and some analytics in it just like SQL Server does in its uh, query engine. It's got its own analytics in it that tries to figure out, should I basically take this whole table and send it down to SQL Server and run it or should I figure out a way to do it in here? So uh, we'll kind of go over that here a little bit too. Uh, how does SQL Server store data? So. Uh, we talked about the Power BI, and we'll look at the SQL Server is, uh, traditionally SQL Server is a row store relational database. Uh, row store meaning that uh, the, every record is stored one record at a time on disk. You got column A, column B, column C for that one record will be contiguously, well, I say contiguously, in theory, uh, from a logical standpoint on disk, uh, it stores them. Whereas column store, it'll store a whole column at a time, then the next column, Virtually, and there's some, there's some nuances to it that make it a, a, that are not straight columns all the way through, but basically row store, row, row at a time, column store is basically the uh, perpendicular to that. I don't know what you call it. Yeah, maybe the inverse, one of those. Uh, both of them have clustered or a heap is a term you'll hear, hear when you get into, uh, oh yeah, when you get into uh, SQL Server tables and indexes. Clustered is actually you could have one clustered index per table. That's how it's physically stored on disk. So it lays it out. That's your, uh, it's indexed in the, usually a lot of times you cluster your primary key, not always, but the clustered index store, it's gonna physically store it on in that direction. Whereas a heap, uh, if you store it as a heap, it just kinda throws it out there. There's no rhyme or reason. You could have other indexes on top of it, but as far as it being on disk, it just kinda, um, it's gonna distribute those kind of evenly across uh, whatever mechanism. There's not a rhyme or reason for the uh, sorting. And I will say, I got it, uh, you, put a, you put a billion row uh, 
heap out there and try to query that thing, pretty, pretty slow. It might be easier to set up a heap in the, in the, in the beginning. Uh, it's one thing, you know, I kind of went through it in stages. I kind of threw it out there. No clustered index and trying to just pull it from SQL Server without a, a clustered index. Whew. You're sitting there all day. It's like, I don't know if this thing's gonna come back. It was like maybe a day, two days, just to get simple queries back on not a very wide table. Uh, row store versus column store. Uh, I think I just answered those questions probably, uh, but this kind of goes a little bit deeper. Row store, good for transactional purposes. Uh, transactional database, as you got a sale comes along, you need to record the transactions of that sale uh, as it's happening. Uh, usually have a more uh, normalized database structure with that. That's good for, uh, as, as the app, I, I kind of talk about it. It's like, okay, that's the application is, you know, the actual application you're using. It's like a sales application. And you want to record all those. You need to be able to uh, have those tables normalized out and you're going to put it a row at a time. Because you're usually reading a record at a time and working on a single record or maybe, maybe a group of records. Whereas uh, column store is good for analytics databases, analytics queries. Uh, with analytics queries, you're not, typically working on a row at a time or a record at a time. I don't really care about, okay, let me, let me do analytics on Abe Newton, uh, the record for Abe Newton. No, you're usually doing analytics on a group of record, like a whole, uh, a whole column within a, a table. So let's say I wanna, uh, what were the sales across the whole last several years? You wanna look, you're, you're, you're looking at the profit columns, you're looking at all your fat columns, your profit, your, uh, your sales tax, things like that. And you wanna be able to do calculations across that whole column. So that's where row store comes in really cool because it's all stored contiguously on disk for that row. So you can quickly, when you get down to the physics of it, the disk can more quickly pull in that whole row, uh, read it all at once. Whereas if you got a row stored out, it might have to read through every single row in that table, read them all in because it, it with SQL Server, we kind of, I might touch on it a little bit but as we kind of talk, SQL Server is gonna read batches of records at a time. It usually, uh, I think it gets, you can get deep into the science on that. It pulls in data pages and it doesn't just pull in one, one column off one record at a time. It's gotta read in batches of records at a time. So you pull in those batches. There's a lot of, uh, you're pulling it, you wanna pull in what you need. So for this kind of stuff, the analytics stuff, we wanna pull in columns is the better way to do that. So we're not pulling in a lot of data that we don't need, because that takes up memory. Uh, the memory ain't cheap. We talk about story, everybody, oh, story's cheap. Well, memory ain't cheap, so we need to be able to store it correctly. On We don't just want to it, throw it out on disk in an incorrect format and waste our CPU cycles and our memory and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and I kinda, yeah, so that's where I kind of mentioned the read. Uh, read a full record would require a lot of disk IO, uh, oh, if you were doing it from a column store. It's just kind of visualization. If you kind of come back through the slides, it kind of shows you a row store versus a column store. I think it's kind of a, ter as I kind of looked more about it, I don't think it does a very good job, but it might give you a little bit of an idea. I'm gonna kind of, I'm gonna kind of go through with some of these a little bit quickly or try to because we've got some other demos I wanna do. So um, some of this is just for the people that are more interested. If you wanna go back and put a few links on here, if you wanna get kind of explore some of this stuff, I, I think there's some stuff that'll lead you in the right direction. I'll kind of fly through some of this. Uh, Let's see, SQL Server row-based store. So that, that's kind of more what I was talking about, uh, data stored in pages and extents. This kind of going to go, if you really want to get down to the technical uh, weeds of how uh, row-based traditional SQL Server tables work, this will kind of get you down and get you down to the disk level and optimize, you know, setting up your, uh, your disks and things like that and formatting your drives and how they're set up for row-based storage. Good, good link in there on pages and extents and architecture and some of the traditional SQL Server row-based, uh, how that's set up. And I kind of put on their black hole warning because it, it gets deep. You'll be reading one thing after another and you'll find out, you'll find the next link and the next uh, this and that. I think it's very, very, very interesting, but it's not for everybody. Uh, <laughs> SQL Server data types, space requirements, because that kind of goes into it as well as we're figuring out this kind of stuff and how do we set up a table and how do we set up our lab for this kind of stuff. Uh, and I just kind of throw in there real quick because you got to really, you, you start looking at the stuff, how the bytes and what's uh, space requirements and calculating. That was one of the things to do, just calculate how much space do I need to populate this table with, table with what I need. Uh, and this kind of gets down into the bytes. Uh, 
Um, how, so you get into var, uh, big int is eight bytes, tiny int is one byte. So you really kind of want to get your space down in the right size, uh, use the right size, uh, and I can even kind of talked about at the top, the uh, var char and things like that. So using the right data type for what you do so you're not wasting space. And it also helps you calculate. Oh, this is cool, yeah, I, I found this kind of cool. How much does it take to store a bit field in a SQL Server row store? And I think uh, if we go back up, oh, what was it? Uh, I think we had tiny int was one byte, uh, which had, allows you to go zero to 255. I'm missing something there, or I forgot something. Uh, I was gonna ask how much, uh, for one bit field, so. A lot of people, the last one, I don't know if anybody would say one bit, uh, would take a one bit. What we actually found out, I was getting some one bit because I was, I was trying to make the smallest table at one point like uh, to hold a lot of rows. Actually takes, uh, for one bit, actually takes one byte, but uh, it was kind of interesting. Uh, the byte was basically the smallest uh, amount it could, uh, smallest data type it could, uh, smallest size data type there was. But if you have, eight or fewer bit columns in your uh, single table. Yeah, uh, I think it was in a, 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 like you could have a table with eight bit columns, it will still just take one byte. It doesn't roll over to the next byte until you go to nine to 16 bit columns. Then you get into the two bytes. So there is some savings on there. It does try to, it does use that space if it can. All right, we're doing page down this time. Uh, so then I kind of got into, so this is just all kind of leading you through the disk base to require to store 1 billion rows in SQL Server row store table. Uh, so I was kind of going off, I was kind of, so at 100 bytes per row, not very big. So you might work at, I've, I've worked at a lot of places where, you know, you might have a small table, but sometimes, man, they just have some big data with a lot of stuff and you're like sitting there dealing with tables like 200 rows wide. So you got to think about that, or 200 columns wide. A lot of R char stuff in there. So you gotta start calculating, what's that doing to my data? Uh, where, you know, what can I shrink down if, I'm, if I need to push this into an analytical database or something? Because you do 200 var char rows, that's gonna take a lot of stuff. So I'm looking at 100 bytes. And I think if you look up, the, the var chars take, uh, can take quite a few bytes if there's a lot of data in it. Uh, so if we look at 100 bytes, uh, at one billion rows was gonna be 100 gigabytes. And that's with no index, that's just the straight up data, no indexes. <clears throat> so you add indexes on there you, uh, for every column, basically double, triple, quadruple your data. Uh, so, and I kind of use that kind of, start looking at putting it in Azure database, it's just building a lab out there uh, and based off the, the gigabytes and kind of approximately work time, 50 hours. I was, I spent a lot of time cranking through loading these, uh, loading the tables. I was looking at like 50 hours a month. 11 cents a gigabyte, so quickly came out, I was like, okay, I need at least $88 a month, give or take, probably double that pretty quickly uh, to keep this thing running in Azure. So that's kind of where I kind of led to, okay, let's just take that money and build out my own lab. There's some stuff on physical drive settings and things that we put on the lab and how we set that up. I'm gonna kind of skip through those. Feel free to go back and read those. I'd love to hear your comments. Uh, discuss them on the online on the Slack channel would be awesome. Uh, more detail on column store, reasons why they're fast, some of the bottlenecks and things we've talked about with the memory and the RAM, uh, some of the use cases, OLTP versus analytics workloads, and some good links on there. Um, compression, I will mention compression. One thing on column store indexes, uh, is the compression very, uh, it's, it's much better, especially if you have a low card, if I speak right, if I say the wrong thing, I'm sorry, uh, sometimes I, I say the opposite, but uh, low cardinality on your table or on your columns in your table, uh, it can get a very good high compression rate. So basically when I say the low cardinality, like basically repeating values, how many distinct values are in that column. Uh, so if you have a, a large dimension or a large fact table and there's repeating values, so let's say it's just holding values from zero to 10, well, and you've got a billion rows in it, well, you only have, it'll store those basically as 10, uh, it'll crunch those down into basically 10 records, and then it has a little uh, lookup dictionary that looks it up. So basically you can go from, in a row store, it, does, it doesn't get that kind of compression, and you're looking at, like I said, several hundred gigs of data, whereas a column store, if you have a 
low cardinality, it can store in a fraction of that, basically. And with that, frac that, that less disk space, it can pull uh, SQL Server, uh, the column store technology, is, it, it also helps it move that data into memory a lot quicker. It doesn't take near as much space, so it can kind of pull that in batches into memory and work on it much quicker because it's a smaller, smaller, smaller size. It's already crunched out. It's, uh, uh, it's already compressed. Uh, and then I kind of wrote in it. You can get additional, uh, if you have some large, very, very large tables, and you can do this with, uh, you can put some additional SQL Server compression on those tables. Um, in addition to what, and this goes for row store as well as column store. Column store in addition to what it's already doing with its, uh, uh, by default, column store compression. You could put additional SQL Server compression on top of it and shrink the size of those on disk. Now, when you do that and you're reading those records in, it's got to uncompress those records so there is some CPU bottleneck in time, but depending on the size of your tables, it may be worth it to reduce the reads and things you've got on disk. So just kind of put that as a, uh, to save space and less disk I.O., but more CPU resources. Oh, okay, back to demo, exploring direct query versus import. Uh, I kind of want to get to a quick demo of, I think there's two demos here I wanted to do. Uh, so real quick, I'm going to pull up Power BI once again. Been a while since I've done this specific demo. Let's see how good my skills are. Um, so we're going to pull up the Power BI desktop version, not the cloud version this time. And I'm going to basically go to our. See if I've got my SQL Server Management Studio up. Yes, I do. Can you all still hear me? Okay, is it coming through good? All right. So as you can see, I've got several different versions of this Wired World importers. Um, I want a smaller version. They have a, so they have a transactional data burst. If you ever need some dummy data, it's a good one. Just go look up Wide World Importers from Microsoft. It's got, it's all set up with a lot of their cool features. Uh, they have a transactional database called Wide World Importers and they also have a data warehouse database built on top of that called Wide World Importers DW, which is in more of a star schema format. And they also got some cool ETL workloads that'll help move data from point A to point B, like in an SSIS package, and some workloads that'll actually populate the transactional database. You can kind of, you kind of build little scenarios out. It's kind of cool, and you can modify them and kind of work through some end-to-end uh, -end data warehouse, warehouse kind of stuff. The only downside, the database is pretty small. Like I said, like their fact table is only like a few hundred thousand rows. So I had to do some work to put some bulk the table up. Uh, we have a. I want to say DW full one. I always get confused. I think that's my large fact table. So if we run SQL Server reports, standard reports, disk usage by top tables, and this will tell me if that's that one or not. And that is not that one. Oh, there we go. Large one. That should be it. I'm going blind, so it takes me a little while on these little screens. Disk usage by top tables. Document site. Oh, I think that's bad. I think we got to do that once, I think. Magic. Yeah, there we go. So there we've got our fact sale table with a billion, 1.008 billion rows. Um, and we can kind of see the data, the data itself on this one, I kept it kind of small. I didn't have it at 100, uh, I don't think I had 100 bytes or per row, so a little smaller. So we have, the data was only 24 gigs, but we have, it's got some indexes on there. So we've got 202 uh, gigs worth of indexes for a total of about 226 gigs or so of space for that table for that billion rows. So, you know, if we went to two billion, now we're looking at 500 gigs worth of space. Uh, on these, on the data warehouse, I actually, on this one, after a few, uh, messing around with it a few times, I've actually got, let's look at the storage real quick. Sorry, I'm kind of going off track with the original demo, but I kind of want to show you this stuff as well. I uh, thought it might be more interesting to the SQL Server user group. Uh, storage, okay, tables. Fact sale. Come on, open up. 
Yeah, so on our indexes, this one, uh, originally I had a, uh, I started, like, like originally I put a heap on it and then I started putting other stuff on it. Uh, rebuilt these a few times, uh, putting new records into them. Uh, finally came out, kind of went with the, the recommended model for the data warehouse, which is putting a clustered uh, column store index on it. Uh, you can do a, like I said, you can do a clustered or a heap. Uh, I think the second version I did, I put a row store index on it and with a unclustered column store index. So the CCX underscore fact sale, uh, that is the, let's see if I get the, I'm not gonna get that. Uh, so it's got that, but it's got, in addition, it's got several traditional B tree row store non-clustered indexes that also help with the filtering uh, and the analytic and the lookups and things like that. I won't go into the science of that. Uh, so there we got that. You can also do these. There is a uh, good white paper. I think I had it. It might be in my notes in there somewhere. You can do this. There's a white paper on Microsoft or a, or a link and a guy's deal. One of the experts at Microsoft did this on a transactional database uh, that was actually. He's got a setup for and a link. Basically, you, you can run it on a transactional system. I don't know. Most people are going to be highly opposed to doing that, any reporting off that system. But you technically can put a non-clustered column store index on your traditional transactional database that's doing constant transactions and, and uh, you know real-time transactions and pull, do some operational analytics queries off that using the non-clustered column store index get rid of your B-tree index, your for analytics indexes, and replace it with a non-clustered column store index. And that way it's kind of, you've got a separate index that's out there that you can look up your, uh, hit some of the kind of the fact tables on your transactional database and look at sales and things like that in real time. I'd probably recommend replicating that data over first before you do that into an operational data store separate of that and then putting those indexes on there. But it can be done and there's some kind of best practices built around that from Microsoft, and I think I've got the link in the document in there somewhere. Uh, so with that said, let me uh, check real quick. I'm gonna get the Wide World Importers. Okay, I think it's this one, DW Full. So I'm gonna grab, I came here to grab the SQL Server instance name. Got sidetracked. I was going to copy paste. There's no <laughs> lookup within Power BI to actually get the name of the server. So database, we're going to go. Uh, so within Power BI, we're going to pull in data from the SQL Server database. Come on. There it is. Thought I did something wrong. Uh, SQL Server, and we're gonna grab the... So. Copy that out. Paste the database name, DW full. And we're gonna start with direct query. So you can create a table in Power BI, indirect query, and you can convert it to an import a, a dual or an import table. However, you cannot convert an import table to a direct query table. So I kind of recommend uh, starting, there's some techniques we get around that or you know, work around that later, but I usually recommend if you're kind of playing around, start with direct query and then kind of move into import if you're, playing, if you're trying to build a dashboard, something like that, or a model. Uh, I'm just gonna go pull all, I'm gonna pull the tables directly. I'm not gonna, you can type a query in there and build a custom table in your model. I'm just gonna go out here and grab most of the tables and just kind of pull them in. And the cool thing is with like Power BI, uh, it understands the relationships or it tries to, if there's some key relationships, be, uh, primary key relationships, primary foreign key relationships between these tables, it will uh, grab them and model them for you. You can have one relation, one primary relationship in between uh, two tables. Uh, I'm gonna leave the integration tables off because those really don't have anything to do with the actual data warehouse, just for the loading of the data warehouse model. 
and we're going to click load. Now, what this is doing is it's not actually importing any data. It's just creating the connections to that data model, and basically we get the uh, metadata over here on the right in Power BI, and that allows us to do cool things like uh, throw the city out there and look at, let's see. Clicking on profit, and then we get, so these are real queries going back to the model directly as we're, as we're hitting it there. Um, so everything's pulled, that, that's going in direct query. And one thing I wanna do real quickly as I go through, let's see. I think we're gonna leave this off for now, but there's some cool things. And some of the stuff in here, if you're, if you're modeling, you're, you're kind of working with large amounts of data, which we're not at the moment. We're just hitting the smaller database. You can set some of these settings in here to uh, reduce the amount of queries going through. So if you have slicers and things in your data, that they won't automatically uh, cross-filter all the data and send direct, uh, queries to your SQL Server system on ad hoc on demand, because you can end up sending a lot of uh, queries back and forth really quickly. Um, so that's, uh, so we can pull that data table in. We can, uh, I wanna look at the, I'm more interested in looking at the data model here real quick. So we're gonna look at uh, over here on the left. If we actually had data, we would have another uh, little icon over on the left that would actually show the data within the tables that we could click on each table and kind of see what was in it. Uh, it pulls the data model in. These are all uh, import tables. Uh, we can look at Let's see, I can go to a table and go to its properties and I can actually, I can set it to dual, which at which point it's gonna kind of decide on its own if it wants to, uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna basically cache a version of that table and if it makes sense, it'll use the cache in memory row store version within the model here, but if it doesn't make sense, It'll kind of, at query time, determine if it wants to send that out to the source system or not and run that in SQL Server, or if it wants to use it here locally. Or we can send it over to, uh, so at this point I can still uh, go back to direct query. Cool, great, now we're back to direct query. Or I can go to import. I get a warning uh, as I do this, uh, setting the storage mode to import has the following implications, just be warned. So if you're working with the final version of a model or the only version, version without a back, I always say create a backup before you do that uh, if it's something you wanna keep. So boom, we've got that out there. Uh, we can still, let's throw the, So that right there, we're creating a visualization that's using the fact sales table and the, it's got data from the calendar month table. So the calendar month table, uh, we've got set to imported, it's physically imported. We can see that it's imported because now we have this new cool little deal over here. None of these tables show up, but if you click on, let's see. Where is my table? I'm gonna say that, and now I can't see my data for some reason. Well, it's there somewhere. I cannot find it at the moment, but I would have to dig. But we, we got the new icon. It pulls that data in when we do that. I may have to close and reopen, I don't know. Uh, We'll move on from there because there's some cool stuff I want to kind of get into. What I want to kind of look at uh, before we're done is kind of go back and I'm going to pull down a version of the, the model that we, that we had the dashboard on up in the cloud. I'm going to pull it down and I want to kind of look at uh, some of the queries that it's sending back to the SQL Server system. So let me quickly go back to my PowerBI.com. 
How are we doing on time? You good? Perfect. Okay. I'm going to go back to, so I need the, go to my home, actually, workspace. My workspaces. Look at my dashboard. Okay, direct query, Doug, let's say I want to look at the report, uh, actually the data set that's uh, related to that. I don't think I can pull it down from, oh, there we go. So I can click on the, the data set behind that uh, dashboard that we were looking at uh, in the beginning. Download is a PBIX file, which is a Power BI uh, desktop file. And again, that's the report that was kind of driving all this kind of stuff. So I'm going to open this Power BI desktop file up. It tells me it uses direct query. Uh, it knows my data sources because I have a data gateway set up in PowerBI.com that uh, basically calls a application that's sitting on my desktop or computer back home that allows it to talk to the uh, instance of SQL Server that I have out there and the specific database. And it has the service account built into it, so it'll kind of hit it in there and, and log into the database. So was, when I pull it down here locally, it's looking for the same uh, database in, or SQL Server instance, so same one. So it actually 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 open it from here. If you were to open it on your own server, you would have to change the go into the settings and change the uh, data source. Let's see, continue, and it's going to load up. Now this one, again, is gonna hit the, I think I said the, uh, the full table, it's the one with the larger, yeah, the, or the large one with the larger uh, fax sale table. Am I looking at it? Yeah, okay. So it'll be a little bit less responsive. It's gonna be more responsive because it's sitting local to the SQL Server instance, not having to go over the wire from powerbi.com back down. So it's gonna be a little bit, hopefully more responsive, give or take. Uh, and we'll see, you can see the thing spinning right now, I hope, possibly, if you squint your eyes real good. It's eventually gonna load in. It's gonna to attempt to put the little cool things on there, maybe. So that's, is, while that's going, I want to open up, see if I can do this correctly, okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, look at some of the queries behind it. We're going to do that by the fact that when you open up a Power BI desktop, uh, if you're familiar with SQL Server Analysis Services, it actually creates a SQL Server Analysis Services instance on your machine uh, when you open a Power BI file, whether you have, you don't, have, you don't install analysis services, but it just creates a little instance of SSAS and runs that Power BI model, because the Power BI model that it uses is the same, it's the same engines that they use for SSAS tabular. So it creates an instance on there, and you can see that instance, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna open up SQL Server Management Studio, and we're going to use the uh, SQL Server Profiler to connect to the instance of SSAS that it creates, and we're going to watch the queries that uh, that the Power BI file, the analysis services creates, and we're gonna be able to see the queries that it, uh, how it creates a DAX query and converts that query and sends it down to the SQL Server engine, and we'll get that query text and we'll be able to kind of look and explore those. So I'm looking, I am going to, so if you ever do, so when you have Power BI desktop installed, you come down into the app data, Power BI desktop, there's, uh, you might have a couple of those. I might, I might choose the wrong one. I'm gonna choose the most recent one. So if I have, mul I have multiple Power BI uh, desktops, I have two open at the moment, so it's creating a folder for each one. I'm gonna, create I'm gonna open the most recent one because I believe that's it. Uh, and we're going into the data. We're looking for a file called something port. There it is, uh, ms something dot port dot text. Open it up, all it has is this number in here, this port number. So coming back to SQL Server Management Studio, I'm gonna kinda close up my relational, uh, SQL Server Relational Database instance. 
and we're going to connect out to analysis services uh, localhost since it's running on, my, on on this machine it's creating an instance on the localhost under this port that we just pulled out of that uh, file there and we're going to click connect and let me go back to the thing never did load up with my visuals over here I don't know what happened unless I'm looking at the Hmm. We got them on this one, but I don't see the, oh, there's some, maybe they're just taking a long time, maybe my SQL server, last night it was running great, the week before that, terrible, maybe it's back to terrible, they're slowly popping in, um, so as I do that, I'm going to, so there we go, localhost, we're going to look at the databases on here, we have this cool, I don't know, GUID here, and that's the name of the database that it created, the tabular model database that it created for this Power BI desktop that we have open. Uh, we open it up, we have our tables. We have our tables that are actually part of our model over here. Fact purchase, fact stock holding, all that kind of uh, cool stuff that you see here. We can look at the, uh, I can right click, run a new query, run a DAX query, so you have DAX, MDX, or XMLA, uh, which is uh, three, the three types of queries that you can run against a, they're all for SSAS tabular models or SSAS multidimensional models. Uh, with tabular, you can run basically uh, S, uh, tab, or MDX or tabular will get you answers. With multidimensional, it's just gonna be MDX. So I'm gonna uh, just real quickly show you we can, uh, If I can hit the D key, maybe. Yeah, so that's our city dimension. Not a, not a real large save. I don't want to pull anything huge back uh, coming out of our Power BI desktop model that we just downloaded from powerbi.com uh, out of the cloud. So you could, like, if you're working at an organization, you could pull that down, pull it out, look at it, quickly explore the data that's in any model. Uh, they also have some cool tools that they, uh, at SQL BI, or Power, I can't remember, I, I want to say SQL BI site. Look up the uh, DAX Studio, pretty cool. It's got, they've got some cool tools for actually uh, plugging into Power BI models and querying against them and extracting all the table. It'll do all the kind of fun stuff for you and then you can write DAX against it right there. Uh, but, or you can do it, you can do some of it. Managed to is a little harder, but you can see the SSAS instance. So what we're going to do uh, beyond that, we, now that we're kind of showing that we're hitting that model, I'm going to turn on the, go to the tools in SSMS, and where am I at? Uh, SQL Server Profiler, right at the top. I don't know if that's the same one or not, but we're going to make sure. But we're gonna go, yeah, so we're gonna, we're gonna connect to the analysis services instance that we connected to directly in Managed Studio, except we're gonna use the profiler this time to, and basically, if you're unfamiliar with profiler, just kinda let you uh, run a trace uh, and see some of the stuff that's going on in your system. Uh, careful doing this in production, but we're just in a test lab, so all cool. Uh, there's a couple things I wanna look at. I wanna look at, uh, there's a billion things we could pull out, but, for this specific scenario, I'm gonna look at a couple, of some query events, a query begin and a query end on the analysis services instance, so the, the Power BI, and we're gonna look at, I think it's query processing. Yeah, here we go. Uh, so we're gonna look at Vertipak SE query begin. So Vertipak storage engine, that is the uh, engine behind the SSAS and Power BI, so the SSAS tabular and the Power BI, uses a thing, they, they picked up a company called Vertipak, something uh, that had their cool row-based, column, or column-based uh, in-memory storage engine. So that's the engine it uses. So when you see Vertipak, that's referring to there. So Power BI, say, think Power BI, tabular. Uh, and then we're gonna look for Verge, Vertipak, 
I'm looking for, does anybody see a direct query? Might be in this other one. There it is, direct query begin, direct query end, and we have, I actually didn't want the storage engine, I wanted direct query. That may be, uh, I might be wrong, that might be it. So we're gonna grab those four events and hit run. Trace is running. Now we're gonna go back to our Power BI, go to our dashboard. So this one is hitting the, the large table. Uh, we're gonna click, I'm just gonna click this here to uh, filter our visualizations down to, I guess that's a specific, uh, yeah, we're in the, uh, I think we're in the, either the, okay, the day of month. So, okay, that, uh, that, uh, that updated already, so it ran, it got the result back, updated our visualizations. Uh, this is hitting the, Fax sale, again, hitting the fax sale profit and uh, combining it with a month. All direct query, we don't have any import or anything like that, so uh, all direct query against the SQL Server instance. So let's go, so we ran that, so that what that did is it ran a series of queries uh, and converted them back to T-SQL. So now we got data in here, we got a query begin, query end. I'm going to grab, anywhere you see Vertipack, uh, so, or, or I'm sorry, Vertipack, that's gonna be the DAX. Uh, so if we look at those, we'll see, I think, did I get that right? Hang on. Yeah, here's what I want. I'm gonna go to this direct query here. Take this over and we're gonna go to our, back to our uh, relational database. New query, and we can kind of see what it, it, it broke this down into uh, a SQL Server. It always puts a little wrapper. Give me the top million and one because there's a there's a hard limit on uh, Power BI with the engine that you're not going to get in. You could build these models. You can import these models into SSAS Tabular. They won't have as many hard limits on them. Uh, there is some limits, but it's just not a, they, they kind of self-inflict some Power BI, sometimes to save you from yourself, sometimes to maybe financial reasons, but more often than not to save you from yourself. But when the, it's bringing back an aggregated result, so you're probably never gonna, you're not gonna have a lot of million rows returned anyway. It's usually gonna be an aggregated result against the, so fax sale and combining that with the, the city dimension, uh, where invoice date key is within that specific day. We can run that. Bingo, there it is. Thank you. <laughs> 2002 Q4, boom. So it's hitting that. Um, I wish I could zoom in more. Unfortunately, SQL Server Management Studio is not gonna let me see the result uh, zoomed in more, so it might be kind of hard to see, but it did aggregate those, uh, gave us the, the profit is in one of those A0, A1. Uh, for that specific day uh, date uh, that we filtered it down to. And we can look at, uh, since we're in SQL Server 2017, we can look at the live query statistics. It's kind of nice. Uh, did I just hit something? Stop it, okay, there we go. Um, I don't think we can zoom this. Oh, we can, cool. And we can see, we hit a column door, a column store clustered index scan. Um, I'm not great at all the details of these, uh, the column store index one yet, but we can, we can kind of see that it hit it, uh, it ran it. That thing came back in less than a second. Uh, that is a table with over a billion rows in it. I know I've done some work on some of the other ones, like I was saying, I had a heap one. It would just run for days, just doing simple queries like this. Uh, same visualization, spinning them off would never come back until I put the column store clustered index on top of them. Um, we can hit, I want to look at another, so another thing I want to show you on this, let's see if I've got a, I'm gonna bear with me as I move this back up so we can bring back our line chart. We only have two dots here because we're on a, 
uh, a single day in history. So I'm going to try to get this drilled back up where we see everything. Let's see. I might be at, oh, bear with me. Sometimes I'm still terrible at controlling the visualizations. I think we're still. Come on. Oh, that was, let me let that one finish spinning. See if it comes to life. And there's a whole, there's a whole slew of stuff, if, especially if you're getting into SQL Server, you know, like so tabular, uh, SSAS tabular, you can kind of come in here and still run the profiler against this. You can run uh, extended events trace as well. I just haven't found as good of, they haven't done, I, I, from my perspective, I haven't seen as much as far as they're not giving as good events back yet. Maybe they're still building it out, but you can get some information back. It seems like to really get the good stuff, I've had to pull up the profiler, but you can get stuff like cache hits, what's hitting the, uh, the uh, engine cache in SSAS tabular and kind of where you can do some uh, adjustments just like you would in SQL Server uh, relational database to make the query more optimized. There's things you can do to uh, optimize, see what's going on with your queries, your DAX queries, uh, your queries against your model there. So you might be building uh, as a developer, uh, as building these models, a lot of times I'm tasked with building uh, measures, which are basically almost like views within the tab of the model, and they can get very complex really quickly and sometimes they run very slow and you one of your things you're going in there and kind of figuring out what's going on and some of this stuff can give you some insight into what's going on with that. Okay, there we go, we came back and I wanted to real quickly, if I remember correctly, click my drill down, I think, and probably gonna mess that up. I think it's going. Let's see if this is what I wanted it to do. I basically wanted to send back a, without going and setting up a whole date-based uh, visualization, date dimension-based visualization, try to send some stuff back to it. Let's see if it's creating a query. Vertipack, okay, direct query begin. Yep, I think this is it. I think, maybe not. Okay, there we go, perfect. Um, so as you can kind of see, as you're getting, so <laughs> some of these queries can get very large because uh, it's basically having to send that whole set of dates back, basically mimic that, it, it's basically sending the filter back to it. So it's grabbing all these, this date range, these dates that you're sending. Sometimes it get a little complicated, but it, it still runs, it can run very quickly. So that's a, what, 3,700 line query that it generated in a fraction of a second. We run that, it's gonna have to wait for the query plan first time, because it uh, doesn't, should have had that already, I thought, but. Okay, so it came up with the query plan. It executed it, so. Hits the column store index again, as we can see over here, and throws it through, uh, pulls it all back together. Um, so if we run that again, it's gonna run really quickly because it should already have that plan, I would think. Maybe not. It's probably taking a long time just because it's, I don't know, if it, with a 3700 line query, it might just take a long time just get that, find that if it is caching it. So there you go. I thought that was kind of interesting. One thing to note, if you are using direct query uh, and you're in a place that has sensitive data, you do have to be worried that if uh, someone like a SQL Server admin or some, anybody who has uh, 
insight into logs and ability to run profiler traces, can see the query of, uh, queries that are sent from these systems. So it may be that somebody's got a separate file, maybe they create a dashboard with SQL Server data that's allowed by everyone to see, but they've got a special private file, it's got people's SSNs and things on it that normally you wouldn't see exposed in the SQL Server system. Well, when they send that query, it might send all those records because they've imported, they've built a model, it's in uh, dual mode. We've got all the SQL Server tables going out in direct query mode to the SQL Server engine, but we've got this separate one-off instance where we want to combine it and mash it up with this separate record, this separate set of data, more sensitive data, run some numbers on it. Very common in a lot of places to run stuff like this, but they want to kind of keep it in a small group, don't want to share it with the larger audience or let it get out. Be wary that your DBAs, things like, it's something to be aware of to kind of let people know, it's like, that might pop up. It might, you might inadvertently expose data through your law, through your traces, things like that. So it, it could come through as a query. Uh, if, you're, if you're logging queries, if you've got some kind of ongoing log, it can come through there as well. That was kind of a combination of both those demos. I think I kind of covered them both all at once. Thank you, feel free to reach out with, you can reach me at the contact info below or on the Slack channel at Techlahoma if you have any questions. Anybody have any questions, feel free to ask or like I said, ask them at a later date. Do we have any questions online? Was there any viewers online? Do we hit the billion row, or the billion view count that we were trying for today? Thousand, billion, thousand billion. They did, they poured in. They loved it. Skull Crusher. I don't think I've met Skull Crusher. Sounds intense. Sounds intense. I like Florida, though. I love Florida. Okay, so what he's asking is, where in Power BI, the Power BI application, can you actually write a SQL Server query? And I think what you're asking is to actually physically import data into Power BI as an import and where you do that, uh, kind of like he's, uh, he's done with uh, Crystal Reports. Yeah, I can, I can show you that real quick. It's not, not a difficult thing. We were pretty much there earlier. I'm gonna go to my smaller database that runs quicker uh, model and within the model. So that screen you saw me at the beginning, we were pulling in all the data. That was uh, the same, it's just one of the, the links they have on the beginning. You could ideally just come, typically you go to modeling, uh, I'm sorry, home. Go to the, from the home tab on the, whatever they call these ribbons. I'm not good with all the terminology of these. Seems like they always change. So uh, get data is where you're gonna go. And click on SQL Server. So right there, where did, uh, actually, hang on, I wanted to, sh there it goes. Oh, if you actually, okay, don't use the drop down. you actually get the full list. They have a whole lot of, you can get data from a bunch of sources uh, when you're using import. Uh, direct query is much more limited to like four or five specific sources because that's a lot of work to treat. Whatever it's doing to convert all this DAX to T-SQL, that's, that's some crazy work. So there's not as many, but there's a lot that'll import and you can mash them up together. So if I come in and go to database, SQL Server database, I'm gonna turn off my trace Go back. Oops. Doesn't let you copy right out of there. I saved it the properties. No way I'm typing in all that. I'm just gonna hit the small. Sometimes you get the brackets. 
and I got to find the delete key. So here, right here, I would hit, um, if you hit import, and if I hit OK, it's going to take me back to that screen where we actually import the full tables. Uh, I think you're asking is, how do I write a SQL query? Yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah, and I probably hit the wrong button. Uh, and the cool thing, I think both like the Power BI user group and the SQL Server user group, great, if you use, especially if you're using both of those. Because uh, they got a whole thing. I've been learning M language uh, as well. Uh, from time to time, M languages, so from Power BI, it, it uses DAX to query the, uh, uh, the model, but it uses, it has a, a mashup engine language called M. So if you're doing import, it uses uh, this whole step, and you see it within uh, Excel as well, uh, Power Query. Power Query and M are the same thing, uh, but you can actually get down to the steps of the language. If there's a lot of filtering, uh, you can go to the advanced editor, It'll put all these steps over on the, I guess it'd be your right hand, yeah, on the, on the right hand side we see up there. And as you add filterings, it'll write the, the M language code into this, and you can uh, modify the steps in a text editor as you go, as you see fit. You can actually get into some really deep stuff and some really cool combining and mashing up of data and filtering, uh, adding in parameters, things like that, in this language in itself without, not talking about DAX, just talking about Power Query M language because uh, a lot of times you see the easy stuff which is just kind of like, ah, oh, it's like, ah, oh, it just does this and this. It gets deep. I've got, uh, there's a guy that goes to the Power BI user group and he's written some deep stuff just on, the, on his blog on the M language. Learned a lot just talking to him, reading his stuff. It's confusing though. It gets confusing quick, but you can do some pretty cool stuff and it's got a really cool interface because there there's a lot of magic, especially if you're in a place where it's not as big of an enterprise, or you got a you know, smaller scenario, you need to get something up quick, you need to mash this data together. You may not have a bigger enterprise, sometimes enterprise will have this stuff, but they won't let you have access to that data, and you need to do something quick, get it together, so you mash it up. And I look at that as like, hey, I'm prepping the data. I've worked both sides of that fence. I've been the guy that like, I understand like, you don't need access to do, do this, but I always look at, if I'm on the guy, the business analyst, my job is to build that, help build, prototype that, uh, that cube, that model form, that tabular model, uh, match the data up and then kind of work with the, the architects to move that to an enterprise, maybe an SSAS instance or a more enterprise ready Power BI model as we build it out. So I always think, you know, so, but it's a great prototyping tool and then a lot of this stuff can get uh, forwarded directly to SSAS tabular. Uh, when I talk about SSAS tabular, a lot of stuff, so people are going to Power BI, they're asking about Power BI, Power BI modeling, powerbi.com, um, and they'll have, maybe they'll have a premium capacity in the cloud. There's still, SSAS tabular still has a big place in all this. A lot of this stuff grows out. Uh, it gets too big for Power BI, or it, maybe it needs to be shared across the entire enterprise. You can do a lot of that with powerbi.com, and the new tools are coming out. They're kind of melding together, but there's still some of the stuff, some of the more secure stuff, you want to put that into a, an SSAS tabular instance, whether it sits on-prem or in, uh, they have Azure analysis services now. There's different ways to do that. So it's the same model, same engine. Uh, still uses DAX, MDX to query it, so. Yes, SQL Server analysis services. So it comes with, that's part of the SQL Server enterprise, and well, it also comes with uh, standard as well. Uh, it's the, it's the analytical database piece of SQL Server, so uh, it's a, DAX is a good language to learn. I tell that, so learn T-SQL, I spent years and years and years learning T-SQL. Now I'm trying, I still call myself intermediate DAX, I can't, uh, it's a tough language. It starts off easy, but then it gets really tough, so I'm, that's my goal now is to become expert at DAX, so, but it's gonna be, it's gonna take a few years.
a few more years, <laughs> already a few years in, so good question, sorry. Anything else? That's all I have. Uh, did you need to say anything or are we? Uh, I think I pretty much wrapped up, but I'm sure I would be presenting. Thank you.